Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Lisa Nieves. I am the president of the Fund for the City of New York. I'm also a workforce practitioner founding a workforce program, and I've also been a researcher and scholar on workforce. It's an honor to be here today moderating the K-12 student session. And this is a session that's called Students Are Exploring Career Pathways Earlier and Earlier Through Work Opportunities in and Out of the Classroom. These programs offer young people the chance to gain the abilities and training necessary to be successful as they transition to adulthood and careers. I have a wonderful group of panelists that get to join me today, and I'm going to go by their names and then and titles, and then each of them is going to introduce themselves for a couple of minutes to let you know about who they are. So the first panelist is Spencer Sherman, who's a director of the Office of College and Career Readiness at Rhode Island Department of Education. Hi, Spencer. How are you? Doing well. How are you? Excellent. The next panelist is Vanessa Worthington, who's a Deputy Director, Workforce and Federal Programs at the D.C. Department of Employment Services. Hi, Vanessa. Hi. Happy to be here. Great. And the third panelist is Makita Vela, Assistant Chief Grants Administrator for the City of Los Angeles Economic and Workforce Development Department. Hi, Makita. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Oh, glad, glad to be here. So what I would really enjoy is first, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the session's goals are, and then I'm going to have each of you introduce yourselves. Is that okay? Great. All right. So first here, I want to uh, make it important to know that promise, when we're thinking particularly about college promise, promise policies seek to leverage higher education as a mechanism for improving the lives of all Americans. In today's fast-paced and interconnected world, it is more important than ever to break down silos and make sure that in every stage in a student's life cycle, from, K from cradle to career, we're working together to support positive academic and career outcomes. And what I love most about that statement is we're not saying that they're separate, they're interrelated and connected. And that's why all of you are on this panel, because you see these connections, and I'm excited that we get to share that with the rest of the audience. Second thing is the goal of the session is to discuss the target and target outcomes for career services in K-12 and what partnerships can achieve, particularly with those objectives, and what does the future look like in this area. And the third is we will speak with experts about the topics early, such as career counseling and the importance of establishing marketable and transferable skills. Okay, is that clear, everyone? Kind of the expectations and outcomes, great. So let's start with Spencer Sherman. Spencer, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, and thanks for having me, Lizette. All right here, I guess, I mean, my living room, but uh, virtually here. Um, so uh, my name is Spencer Sherman, and I work for the Rhode Island Department of Education. Um, I got into this work, I'm originally from Connecticut, but I got into this work initially as a teacher. So I was a high school science teacher for a number of years, and I became a high school administrator, and um, then I moved over into the policy realm. Because I think what really excited me about education um, was that it built pathways for kids to um, become the first in the family to go to college. And then it really changed the economic trajectory from where they were before to where um, they will be in their lives and where their kids will be. And so that's, I think, what a lot of what I do now in my current job. It's all about um, building on that potential um, for kids. So I am the director of the Office of College and Career Readiness at the Department of Education in Rhode Island. And what I do in that role is I oversee all of our high school work all of our adult education work, um, and the connections between high school, college, and the workforce. Um, the umbrella initiative we have in Rhode Island is called Prepare RI, and um, I'm really excited about um, what we've been able to do with that initiative, kicked off by the governor three years ago, that bridges all these programs together, and also connects to our local um, Promise program called uh, Rhode Island Promise that provides free community college at uh, the local um, community college here in Rhode Island. Thank you, Spencer. I'd love to go to Vanessa. Wetherington now. Hi, good afternoon. Vanessa Wetherington, Deputy Director for Workforce and Federal Programs um, at the DC Department of Employment Services. Um, my primary focus is on uh, LIOA funded programs um, and ensuring that the system is all interconnected. So we work very closely with our um, Office of the State Superintendent of Education's CTE programs, our um, 
colleges and universities, primarily our University of the District of Columbia, to ensure that both our young people and our adults who are transitioning from um, K-12 into adulthood have those um, direct connections to both the workforce and post-secondary education, be it um, the traditional route or the non-traditional route via apprenticeships or other um, routes to uh, obtaining a credential. Wonderful. Thank you, Vanessa and Makita Vela. Tell us about yourself. Yes. Good afternoon. Thank you again for having me. My name is Makita Vela. Um, I actually started out in education as well. Uh, began running uh, the Title I um, programs in Clark County uh, and then eventually received my doctorate in organizational uh, leadership. Decided that being in education is amazing. You learn so much from the young people in the communities you serve, but what's that transition into the workforce and how, how do we ensure that our youth are ready? And so I pivoted into working for the Workforce Development Department for the City of Los Angeles. The Economic and Workforce Development Department in the City of Los Angeles um, has two arms, so to speak, an economic side where they work with uh, community members to form small businesses. And we also have the workforce development side where we have components um, of WIOA funding, city funding, county funding, private funding, and we have both an adult and youth uh, division. And within that uh, group of or section in EWDD, I am the director over the youth uh, workforce development department services. And we braid together our funding and our practices to ensure that our youth in under underserved communities uh, receive all the support and resources necessary to build a sustainable future. Um, and we've also this year tied to the College Promise Works program in Los Angeles, and we are also creating um, pathways through the community colleges for the future of work. Great, well, thank you so much. So we get to jump into the questions now, because I know what, what I want to say to all the folks who are listening to us is that we clearly have a great cross-representation of engagement around youth workforce engagement and education. So thank you very much. I love it that this is also a group that represents not just anchoring in the silos. It's more about what are the ideas that we're going to meet at. We're going to talk about that. So thank you for that too. And the one thing I will say to our panelists is there may be quite a few people who may not be familiar with the acronyms that we throw out. So let's just try to um, just use some broader terms or just say some federal or state workforce funding. I think that can help a lot when we're talking about different things. Fair? Yeah. We're great. We're all on the same page. Excellent. All right. With that, we get to jump in into the first question. And this is one, and it, this question is um, very important to me because so often when we talk about workforce development, we separate the K-12, particularly the nine through 12 from early college, right? We separate those two in thinking about it. And yet that's not the way young people think about it. They don't see these distinctions in the same way that we do. All three of you really represent what I call um, the futurists in this field. So we know that early action and exposure to career advice and skill building experience is important for the K-12 system, particularly for the high school system, right? Um, how is your organization doing that right now? And how are you defining success in doing that? How about we start with Vanessa first? Sure. So um, many of you don't know this, but DC is a single state entity. And so we operate as both the state and the local um, government in some instances. So we have a lot of um, areas where we blend both our federal and our local uh, monies together to accomplish goals such as exposure for K-12 into um, adult workforce programs. We wrote, work really closely with our um, CTE program in this area on um, connecting them to uh, careers in high in demand industries such as IT, engineering, um, other fields, apprenticeships. Um, is a field that is really up and coming. So we uh, work really closely with them to ensure that there is not just um, an easy transition from 
uh, K-12 to um, adult workforce programs, but also a warm handoff. So we like to introduce them to both sides of the house early on. We have um, worked together to form our first uh, youth apprenticeship program um, last year, where we worked directly with um, students who were in high school who would be interested in going into um, apprenticeships, who knew they wouldn't want to go into a traditional post-secondary experience so that early on they could they could be exposed to what does post-secondary education look like, um, what path, what track might be for me, and what are the avenues that I need to go on to get to my end goal, which is ultimately employment, sustainable employment. Um, because we know that life in the district or in you know many Los Angeles as well is pretty expensive. So making sure that they're not just employed, but that they have sustainable employment in the long term. Thank you, Vanessa. And how about you, Spencer? Talk to me a little bit about how you are blending the high school exposure um, as well with your organization. Yeah, I, I think very similar to uh, what Vanessa was saying. I think it's really important that we do that work of blending it for kids. So I think what often happens is there's a very complicated system on the back end. Like all of us um, on this panel and all the different acronyms, we all, as you mentioned, right? We know federal versus state funds Kids don't care about that. Families don't care about that. And so it's our job to make it really, really easy for them to navigate this system. And it's actually really complicated to make things simple, but it's our job to make it simple for them. Um, so I think that is sort of the headline of what we're trying to do at the Department of Education in Rhode Island uh, under this initiative that I mentioned before called Prepare I. What we do is we bring together the governor's office. We bring together the K-12 system, which is me, the post-secondary system, the public colleges, the um, workforce development boards, and the Department of Commerce. So these are all the people representing all parts of the system, from K-12 to college to workforce. We all meet together on a weekly basis, and we're all built around the same goals, because I think we all know like, what gets measured is what gets managed. Um, and we have goals that we do for check-ins on a monthly basis uh, with the department heads of all the different agencies. So more concretely for our uh, work, we have three big goals that I'm trying to hit um, as the director of, of my office. First is that kids graduate. Second is that they're proficient in English and math. And third is that what we have, what we call a diploma plus, which means they have a diploma plus something that takes them to the next level of what happens after high school. So it could be plus college credit or it could be plus the industry recognized credential. And so with those three things that you've got a high school degree, you've got some foot in the door for the next thing, and you've shown that you have sort of the basic academic skills, that is like what we think of as a good graduate. And so there's all going backwards from there. We have a bunch of intermediate goals, but that's sort of our headline vision for what we measure at the outcome um, for when our kids leave our high school system. Thank you so much, Spencer. And, and uh, I was excited by how Vanessa highlighted the apprenticeships and the hands-on experience that I, that I was excited. And I loved how you highlighted all the academics, right? Because it's a both and, right? It's not an either or in a lot of ways. It's a both and. And that's what I'm inspired by, particularly in this K-12 session to really talk about that as complementing each other, not taking away from those, right? Not pitting academics versus work, that we can have them together. And so, Makeda, I'd love to hear from you. Hi, yes. So in Los Angeles, we found that it was really important to develop young people, um, again, tying in the academics and the workforce development, how do you do that? What are you building upon? So it's not just about the traditional skills that they build um, through their core educational programs. It's looking at those core skills that are needed to be transferable to the workforce. Um, so, so how do you do that? So for us, we have a program um, that see around is ages 14 through 24, and we focus on work readiness, uh, the soft skills building, the teamwork, the time management, the organization, and we build that throughout. And so as these young people are in middle school, high school, they're looking at how do I have these innate skills that are transferable in the workforce or in a professional setting. Um, and we explicit that through our um, modules that we utilize for our young people. And so we're helping them to make those connections as they move through not just their academics, but as they are in, in the community socializing. A lot of the providers that we utilize are CBOs um, and they're in the community working on civil engagement. Um, they are also looking at the different uh, 
industry sectors that are high growth sectors in LA, there's tech, there's um, digital media, and, and they're looking at these young people and saying to them, there are paths for you. There are ways for you to have a sustainable lifestyle and outcome, a living wage job in LA. And how do you do that? And how do you understand that you are preparing you not just for a job or a career, and how do you capitalize on the skills that you have to maximize the trajectory for your future? How do you do that? And we're constantly making sure that that is a key point. And to build that out, as I mentioned before, we've also partnered with the community colleges here um, in Los Angeles. And so we, we focus heavily on our high school students and getting them to that next level. Um, within the last year, we've also partnered with USC. So you're in a community college, you're on this particular path. How do we now look, look at you as a transfer student if you want to do something else, right? So we're braiding together and tying together these different um, educational institutions, uh, different sectors and industry, um, you know, individuals. And then also the CBOs are working together to form that coalition around our youth to build them up, to build them up so that they are prepared for the future. Thank you for that, Makeda. And, and we're actually, I'm going to ask a question more on partnerships in a, in a few more minutes, because I'd love for you to dig down deep as one of those partners as a model, right? Because I, I think the other thing that's really well represented on this community of voices here is the strength of what it means to be an intermediary, right? All of you function as translators, as creators, right? In some ways, really bridging and translating the language between families, young people, the workforce, partners, schools, right? I mean, that's so often what you do. So I, I, I say this is like the multilingual group of the youth workforce field right here. Um, I'm gonna ask a, the next question I have, and this is related to a lot of the work that I've done, particularly in thinking about high school youth, is, is so often um, I have a perspective that work is a developmental milestone for young people, right? that it is linked to their sense of agency, right? And so often um, young people may not develop their agency in the same way in school settings because they're sometimes still viewed as kids. And for some reason in the workspace, they're looked at as young people. And that even that slight distinction makes them have a, a level of confidence and ownership of agency in a way that I think is really powerful. And that's why I'm excited we're talking about young people. So. I want to hear from each one of you, what are maybe one or two design elements of the programming that you do that you can dig down deep in, even if you touched on some before, that you believe are really distinct and highlight and support youth agency and kind of youth increased navigation for themselves. Um, how about we start with um, Spencer this time? Sure. Um, so I'm really glad you brought that up, Lisa, because I think that is a key part of our theory of action for how you better serve kids is you need to empower kids, empower parents, and give them the tools and the, so they need to understand, you know, here's the information that you need in order to navigate this system, but it is really not intuitive to navigate these systems. And as a result, if we don't make active efforts towards educating parents about how to, how to navigate the systems and make them really easy to navigate, then we're only going to privilege the most privileged uh, people in our society. And that's just, that will, you know reinforce systems of inequity rather than undermine them, which is, I think, our hope here. So uh, concretely, uh, one thing I'd like to highlight is um, this initiative um, we have under Prepare I. Um, we've we're developed a new platform, we're actually launching it in a couple months, um, called Enroll RI. It's a single enrollment site for every opportunity for kids and families in the state related education. One website that puts everything in one spot. And so I'll a few, include a few different things that we spent the past few years really developing. First is we have this platform called the All Course Network where I believe we're the only state in the country that has this, where we have an online course platform. It's a statewide course catalog. So kids can take any course they want on that platform. That includes courses at another high school, not the ones that they're currently attending. And Spencer, this was even before the pandemic, correct? Before the pandemic, but it's gotten very, very popular, as you can oh, imagine. Oh, right. with the but I think that's important, right? Like this kind mm -hmm. of technical en engagement that you were able to continue to leverage even during this time. I'm sorry, keep going, Spencer. Oh, yeah, go for it. <laughs> yeah, so I think what we saw, we created that before, and we saw even before the pandemic, kids liked choice, parents liked choice. So this platform, the All Course Network, or ACN, we call it for short, my only acronym, um, 
You can have courses at nonprofits, other high schools, at um, for-profit college. I'm sorry, sorry, for um, private colleges, also for community colleges. All of those are in just one easy to uh, navigate place. Um, so kids really love that. We're also we're building out is we have free dual and current enrollment in the state, which means high school kids can take classes at their community college or the public colleges in the state for free. And they've had been able to do that for years, but we're now putting that onto that same platform, so it's really easy for kids to navigate. And because once we started making it free, we found that the number of kids taking college credit courses doubled. Actually, at this point, more than doubled because it was free and it was easy to access. Um, the last is our current technical education programs. So again, that's grown by about 150% in the past three years because we've done a lot of work on making CTE or career technical education is not just about sort of what I did when I was a kid, like the wood shop kind of jobs. This is about computer science. We spend a lot of time and effort expanding computer science, expanding um, wind energy is growing. Um, so those green jobs are growing. So we're expanding those programs and kids love them. We actually have a program in the state where you can enroll in any career and technical education program in the state regardless of your home high school. So if you want to be a bioengineer and they don't have a bioengineering program in your high school, you can enroll through this program, find another high school that does have the program that you want, and then enroll in, in that program. So I think all our core idea here in Rhode Island is that if you empower parents, give them good options, and then make it really easy for kids and families to navigate those options, you see a huge, huge growth in um, their uptake. Yeah, and I, and I want to highlight two things that Spencer said, because I know we're going to have so many practitioners that are listening to us, right? At last count, we probably have about 400 or more folks who will be listening to this. So how exciting is that? So I wanted to say this, a couple of things that Spencer said that really ring true also with some of the research, right? We're seeing a lot now that we have what we call an engagement crisis because high school students are working online. The truth is it's only an engagement crisis when they're not also selecting. When they are selecting and they have ownership, tech can be a viable way of connecting, but maybe in a traditional setting, it's not. So I wanna highlight that nuance that Spencer's talking about, right? Um, I think the other thing is this idea that it's accessible and flexible, and it's easy to understand for families. Because young people make choices, not just as individuals, they make choices in a collective context often, and that's with their families. So, so thank you for those two drilling downs. I'm going to go to Makita, and then we'll end with Vanessa. Makita, talk about one or two uh, particular practices and models that you have that could be highlighted for our people who are listening today. So there's a couple of things that we're doing here in LA and that uh, you noted um, post COVID have come about, right? So the first thing is that we now have a online platform for our applications for the summer employment, which again, it says summer, but it's year round. And so youth can go on there, on that platform continuously, reach out to the CBOs, uh, select a CBO, upload applications, and then be selected for work experience. Um, in addition to that, we are also partnering with um, LAUSD the um, Los Angeles um, School District to um, develop a database and data bank for apprenticeships. They have a linked learning program that is tied to the high school students and obviously beyond vocational um, education in adult ed. And, and now we have a database where young people can look there to find out while they're at home, what are the apprenticeships that are available? How do I tap it? What do I do next if this is what I want to do? And the last thing that I'd like to highlight is a uh, model in LA that's somewhat been adopted nationally, which is a P3 model, and it's our wraparound services. And so to Spencer's point in engaging the families and the youth and making sure that they're able to navigate, this P3 program that we have here provides um, a space, an outlet for young people, those that are um, having issues with mental health, those that are um, homeless and, and having homelessness issues, those that are in need of other supports. And what they do is, is they come together and they work on a youth, on a case file. How do we support this young person so that they can holistically develop a pathway for them. So not just work, not just school, but also all those other things that affect them socially. Makeda, thank you for that. And, and, and some key takeaways that ring true with what we're seeing in, in data too, is that you know this idea of year round employment, young people between the ages of 14 and 19 are being hit the hardest and carrying the brunt in this pandemic. And they are part of contributing to a family wage. And you are saying, hey, 
keep online applications, remember summer youth employment, right? Remember there are virtual opportunities. And the other piece is that deal with them holistically. Those are great takeaways as well too. I, I didn't want to ignore one other thing that, that Spencer also said too, was linking it to where we knew that there were some career tracks. So he also talked about, and yours did that too, with technology and thinking about how do we leverage this time for young people to not just prepare them for right now, but what could be the future of work? And that's what that's what I'm seeing from both of you. And Vanessa, you get to take us home on this question. Let's hear from you. Yes, thank you. Um, I think a lot of the work we do in our youth office, similar to what um, Nikita said around summer youth employment has been very important. Um, it's one thing to learn about uh, work readiness and then it's another thing to put it into practice. So I might pass the written test to say, I have the soft skills, I'm ready, I'm gonna show up on time. But then when you actually show up to work and you realize what it means day in and day out when I wanna go do something else, um, I think knowing it and putting it into practice is important. And so programs like your summer youth employment program, your year round um, internship, externship programs have really helped us drive home the importance of putting things into practice for both young people and their families. Um, it takes a village. So we do have a lot of parents who call and they advocate for their young people when, you know, I'm missing hours, I haven't shown up to work. And that's our time to say, hey, mom, hey, dad, hey, grandparents, hey, family, you know, putting it into practice is important. Just like you study for your test, you have to put into practice the workforce side, coming to work on time and really driving it home that if I'm late, I'm going to miss my hours and I don't just get them back. Um, I think a lot of other things that we have seen post pandemic is that the digital divide is real. We have a lot of young people who simply do not have access to devices at home that enable them to really take advantage of continued training and continued uh, workforce development activities that we've provided. And so we have driven home that it takes a village, um, you know, thought process, working with our community colleges, working with our libraries, working with our community-based organizations and other partners to ensure that both young people and adults have access at home to the internet, to the devices that they need to still move forward in their journey in post-secondary education, um, occupational skills training to obtain a, a credential, um, and just to better themselves and better prepare themselves for the world of work and the world of education. I really, I really appreciate that, Vanessa. There's no question that um, relying on the infrastructure of the community colleges as well as the libraries is key in this digital divide. There's no question, right? And we see that. And um, I think the pandemic has shown us um, how important libraries are as well too. What do these other institutions mean? What have been safety nets that we may have taken for granted in the past? And really seeing that. So I'm glad you brought that home. But also, uh, I love the piece that you said too, that um, focusing on workforce and building up those soft skills, right? Or just worker skills and navigating skills. It's about applying it over and over again, right? That that's, that's something that you build over time. And, and that's what you're really encouraging. It's not, you get it and it's over. No, it's actually something you have to be committed to. So I appreciate that. Well, we get to go to our third, well, we got a lot of questions to go through, but I know we can't spend all day on them, but I'm going to go to one where I, it, it, it was almost like Vanessa was the plant for the ending of the last question, which is now really going into this question of partnerships, right? That this, and, and partnerships and intermediaries, right? Because you, you play that role too, right? Sometimes we have this expectation, well, if we're dealing with K through 12 with high school students, why isn't the school just taking care of it by themselves, right? All of you know how to knit together folks to make it stronger. Can you give me an example or a deep dive with a particular partnership that has made a difference in your programming that you know that would be really difficult for a school to build on its own, okay? And guess what, Makeda, we start with you this time. Thank you. Uh, so I did mention a couple of partnerships uh, earlier, like USC, the Los Angeles Community College District, obviously, Los Angeles United um, Unified School District. Um, one of the partnerships that I'd like to highlight highlight right now is Unite LA. 
Unite LA has been a strong leader in education reform and workforce um, development engagement for our communities. Unite LA is a thought partner for us. Unite LA helps us on the legislative side um, and they are at the forefront of providing expertise and preparing young people um, for the future. We also connect with them through the chamber, the LA chamber, and we're able to get into those sectors that are high growth sectors and in high demand. They are the conduit for that as well. And so as I mentioned, we are that intermediary. We build upon what the schools are doing. And then we connect them to those CBOs and nonprofits that are out there doing the work on the ground, that are out there uh, making changes in the community, making changes legislatively, and making a difference for those young people and their families. And so we value our partnerships with the Opportunity Youth Collaborative, who focus on foster youth and building a coalition around them and, and their uh, pathways to successful lives. Um, we also work with our city departments and we have Target Local Hire, which is uh, something that is also a national model where we have people in the community that apply to be civil servants without having to take that test, right? So you have many people that have that desire. How do you get into civil service? Um, and so what they do is they enroll in our system they are selected from the lottery. And if they're able to put in practice what they've learned through our system um, and professionally succeed, then they're able to, after a year, become a civil, a civil servant or a city. Um, and, and then they can move through our system with great benefits and everything that's afforded to other city workers. So we are really trying to develop the workforce in Los Angeles. Um, obviously, through United LA, through our other partnerships, from the cradle into the continuum, right? And so that's what we're, we're doing. Um, we are looking to expand our partnerships as well. This year, we actually are taking a little bit more deep dive into the different sectors and what's going to be the future after this, this um, pandemic. And when we look at the future, what's going to be um, options for our young people for sustainable lifestyles. Um, and so that's, that's huge in LA, especially with the cost of living here. And that's what we're working for to ensure that our young people have an opportunity to thrive. Yes, and, and again, I love this example, especially from, I'm sure each of you will do that, but when you think about government and public service, right? Again, how do we serve as catalysts, right? For others, how can we bring coalitions together to get this work done. And that's definitely what you're doing. And I think the other piece, Makeda, is you mentioned a population that doesn't often get the kind of visibility and support, support around workforce is, is those in the foster care system, right? Like your intentionality is important and a traditional school system may not have the capacity to do that. And that's a value that you're bringing to the table. So thank you, Makeda. How about you, Vanessa? Let's hear from you. Sure. I think one um, partnership that we have formed that we have seen a lot of success with um, is our partnership with our fire and emergency uh, fire and EMS um, organization. So they are a sister agency. And what we have done is we um, directly connect participants to the opportunity to become a fire cadet um, through a, an MOU. Um, we fund a cohort every year of um, fire cadets. And those individuals would traditionally be competing with hundreds of other individuals who want to become a fire cadet. But through the use of additional funds that are awarded to our agency, we go into this partnership with them to say, hey, we have individuals who meet the qualifications who we would like to recommend and who we would also like to pay for. Um, and so that money um, includes their salary, um, it includes all of their training, their equipment, um, anything that they would need to go through the fire cadet program. And we've seen huge success. We've seen hundreds of individuals who would normally not be able to um, be become um, a fire and EMS professional now have that door open to them. I think partnerships with um, sister agencies is important. Um, it shows that collaboration and that interconnectedness around um, both education and workforce development. We know that there are some educational components that they have to fund that with you know budget cuts and COVID might not exist anymore. And so wherever we can, we want to push individuals to know that, you know, let us help you get on this pathway to um, the middle class and to 
a sustainable income. And I think our partnership with our uh, fire and EMS agency um, is one of them that shows that there are multiple doors to get to, um, you know, your outcome. And, and, what I love about those examples are, again, where we have seen that there have been major challenges across the country, A, in getting pipelines for what are excellent careers. And you're, but you're able to do it in a way that where the fire department would not be able to do it themselves. You have a youth adult development lens, right? Like Makita has that as well, like Spencer has it as well. But you're able to build that and translate that again. That's, that's very exciting to see that happen. Thank you, Vanessa. And Spencer, close us out on this question. Sure. And I, I do really, I think um, Makita and Vanessa's examples are very good ones. And I think there's stuff, it's like hiding some of the same issues I think we're trying to address too, because like those are the core problems. If we don't as government handle those issues, no one else will, right? And so it's us up to us to make sure um, that we're building, like Vanessa said, those pathways to the middle class for folks. Because um, once we build that pathway, other people can follow it. Um, I think the general principle that I think a lot about is forming silos is just, it's like a law of nature. It's going to happen. The best we can do is fight against it. It's like a centrifugal force that like we're going to pull people apart. What we need to do rather than try to pretend that it doesn't exist is just constantly pulling people back together. So I think all of us are going to have silos. And so I think it's really important that you make sure that you're fighting that centrifugal force by institutionalizing those connections. It's not good enough to just have them happen by accident. You have to institutionalize them. So I can give a few examples of how we try to do that in Rhode Island to make sure that it's not haphazard when we're having those sort of difficult conversations across different, um, different silos. Um, so one is between government agencies. So that is a classic silo. What we do in Rhode Island to break that apart is, like I mentioned earlier, we have this group called the Prepare I Core Team that has sort of mid-level to lower-level staff from across different agencies who meet once a week and are kind of friends with each other who know, wait, why are you doing that? I'm doing something very similar. Or wait, have you thought about that when, you know, you, when you're designing that program? That breaks down the government silos, and it's, it's been pretty impactful. Another silo is between like government and the people actually implement on the ground. Um, so there's all these ideas that I have that I think are really great, but you know, it's been like five years since I've been in the classroom, and a lot of stuff that I thought was a good idea now is not a good idea anymore. Um, and so what we do is we have this program called the Prepare I Ambassadors. And what we do is we get leaders from the grassroots, school leaders, you know, really great school counselors. Um, we give them a small stipend and um, they become policy advisors for us. So they're full-time working in their school districts, but they become policy advisors and help build toolkits to help create turnkey resources to help other people um, be successful like they are. That helps hold us, make us honest, right? Hold us to the fire when we're proposing something that's just trying to be a really bad idea. And I can't tell the number of never bad ideas I've had. They've called me out on, and it's been a really huge impact um, on sort of redirecting our energies. Um, another group is industry. So um, if I'm building career integral education programs in the state, they're supposed to prepare people for career and help, you know, prevent them for jobs that people actually hire them. You know who knows really, has a really good sense of what people are looking for when they hire folks is employers. So in Rhode Island, the people who set the standards for what are career education programs, what you know, credentials they need, is the employers themselves. So we have this state board called the Career and Technical Education, or CTE board, that's a mixture of educators and business leaders who set what the standards are. So if you want to know what you need, what the culminating degree is for an IT program, you have a business leader from IT talking to a teacher who teaches a CTE program in IT, and they figure out what the standard should be. And then we accept that at the State Department of Education, right? Because I don't know that, but business leaders do know that. The last example I give is with um, between K-12 and colleges. So there's a lot of differences. Unfortunately, you know, 13th grade is very different than 12th grade, right? You know, we call it 13th grade. We call it freshman year of college. Um, and so one thing that happens a lot that people don't talk a ton about is just like a drop off. Instead of being a step from K-12 to post-secondary, it's a cliff. Um, so one thing we've done is we've built what we call the readiness project, which is we've worked very closely with the, um, our local colleges and said, what kids are coming to you not ready for college? And it's a lot of them. And that's not just around that statewide. And so, okay, tell us what those are, what the requirements are for them to be college ready. And now we're providing a class now in high school that gets them ready for what they're missing in college. And they'll actually take the exam that they would need to get placed in the college ready coursework while they're still in high school and it's paid for by the state government. So that's another way in which we're trying to 
working in partnership with the colleges to sort of make, make that gap much smoother. So I think overall, the more that you can force yourself to make those connections, institutionalize them rather than make them haphazard, the more likely you are to really create sustainable change. Thank you for that, Spencer. And the, I mean, what comes through loud and clear from your response is the intentionality around each of the transition points and respecting the expertise of these silos while having them talk to each other, right? So I really, and that, and I could see that across all three of your questions. So I have a question because, you know, this is the beauty of getting to get through three key questions first. So I, I get to throw out what I want now. And so some of the ones that, one in particular that I have now in my experience, and this is where we can all just talk as practitioners, is that, we make assumptions in my perspective, I'm curious how you feel about this, that we assume that a young person is going to decide whether they're gonna be on a college track or a workforce track and that's it. When it's quite different. They could be there at 17 saying, I'm gonna do an apprenticeship. And then three years later they reach out and they say, I wanna to go to college, right? I'm seeing a lot of the both and. I'm seeing that there is this craving for the professional experiences, but also understanding how important a traditional credential is as well. Are you seeing that? Is this just something I'm experiencing or, or what, are, what are you seeing? I, I see some head shaking. How about, how about you, Spencer? Tell me, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I completely agree. Sorry, I'm not very, not very good poker face. Yes, totally agree. Um, I mean, my office is called the Office of College and Career Readiness for a reason. We did not choose the word or. Um, and I think, in a word, everyone needs education and everyone need, needs a job. Some jobs you can start with a high school diploma. Some jobs you can start with a college degree. Some need, need a bachelor's, some need a PhD. Either way, you get education, then you get a job. And so I think it's really important that us, that you know, all of us in government um, acknowledge that all those are legitimate pathways for kids. But I think it's super, super important that we don't choose for kids. What happens too often is that we will say, oh, well, you know, here's what I did. So I'll impose my viewpoint on kids. But we think we need to give kids an authentic choice. Prepare them for college. Prepare them for career. Prepare them for both. And let them choose what is the best thing for them. And understand that they may be recreating themselves, as so many people do, right? As so many people do. Uh, Makita, I'm seeing some head shaking over there. So I want to hear from you. And then Vanessa, you'll take us home. Okay. Well, yeah, I was basically saying people definitely recreate. Like I said, I've pivoted from education to now workforce development. What's important is to give them options and to let them see what's possible, right? Not pushing them like, Spencer said, in either direction. Um, and how do you do that? You provide them with the skills that they need. And as Vanessa mentioned before, the practice to continue to show that these are skills that I actually own, these are things that I can do, and to have the vision to see where those may be transferable in other places, right? Um, and so we've also partnered with ZipRecruiter recently, and, and some of their models speak to that. How, how do you utilize the skills that you have and how do you look at perhaps how they may transfer into something else or what are the steps and what's the pipeline into this particular career? How do you get there? What do you need to do? Um, what's the education pathway for that? What's the practical pathway or vocation, vocational pathway for that? Because we have both in many, um, many of the careers that we see today um, and those that we haven't seen yet that are going to be in the future. So how do we prepare them just to be thinkers and, and to move forward in whatever pathway they just decide? Thank you very much. Right. And that, and that, that great piece there too. Because we don't, the future of work, right? We, we, we're not even preparing for jobs that we can expect. So to, to speak with this authority about this is their track is, is not realistic with what, what's out there, what, what will be out there. How about you, Vanessa? No, no, I, I definitely agree. I think that um, oftentimes, you know, as parents, as our parents did, you know, you, you, you have a tendency to push what you think is going to get you to whatever your idea is of, you know, sustainable income or success um, without truly helping a young person understand 
um, that there are many doors. You know, I like to say that there are many doors. We wear many hats. Um, there is more than one avenue. There might be the bumpy road. It might be the, you know, the short road. But ultimately, it's their decision because they have to they have to live with it. My seven year old, she's like, I don't want to do that job because I, I would have to stand all day. Like right now, she recognizes that this job might not be the job for me or that job looks like it's fun. But I think like um, Akita said that um, pathways are important and showing them what the pathway looks like. You know, getting to be a physician takes this pathway. Getting to be a physician's assistant takes this pathway. That's not to say that, you know, you have to go the physician or the physician's assistant route. But if you are seeking to be in the medical field, there is more than one, you know, route to get there. Um, it might not be, you know, the terminal degree of an MD, but you might, you know, want to go the other route and become um, an RN or a PA or a medical assistant. Um, but I think with these partnerships between workforce and career and technical education programs, you get the both, the, the both, right? Um, and I think like Spencer said, the and is intentional. It's not one or the other. And with a career and technical education program, like we do partnering with your workforce programs, you get exposure to both sides. I get the work readiness. I get the internship, externship. I also get to see what the education educational components are that I need to have to get there. And then I get to change my mind along the way um, and, and, and change directions with the guidance of, you know, professionals and my teachers and my counselors and my family. Yeah. And I, and I love that, right? Because that is the recognition of agency. I get to change my mind. I get to rethink, recreate, right? And that's an important piece. So with that said, I want to thank all of you for being part of the session. We're fortunate to talk to you and uh, have a great day. Thank you.